All right, Acts chapter 16 this morning. Two weeks ago, two, two Sunday mornings ago, I preached from this passage. I'm going to preach from it again. Acts chapter 16 and beginning in verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And now that doesn't mean that when he trusted Christ that his entire house would get, it's not teaching what they call corporate salvation. It's not saying that if this fellow would trust Christ as Savior, that that by itself would mean that all of his, his household were saved as well. No, he's saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house, when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be saved too. Amen. Which is what happens in a couple of verses. Uh, verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the, of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Notice there in uh, verse 30, this jailer brought Paul and Silas out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? A couple of weeks ago, uh, or the last time I preached on Sunday morning, um, I spoke from this passage and spoke on the reason the jailer asked the question. This morning I'm going to speak on the question itself, what must I do to be saved? Now Father, thank you for the Word of God, thank you for the privilege that we have of having it in uh, this country and uh, having the uh, freedom to uh, preach it and uh, teach it, and we pray now for your help and for your blessing this morning. I pray that you'll help each one to listen closely, and I pray that you'll help me to preach with the power and fervor and unction of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to hearts, make the Word of God a blessing to your people, and I pray especially for those who may be with us who may never have trusted Christ as Savior. Help us as we focus on this question uh, this morning. I pray that anybody who doesn't know Christ will be drawn to him by the Holy Spirit and that they'll come and trust him and be saved before they leave here today. Please help. In Jesus' name, amen. 
And so then, uh, one of the great accounts of salvation given anywhere in the pages of the Bible is the account of the conversion of the Philippian jailer and his family that we read here in Acts chapter 16. Now, uh, let's uh, get it in our minds what happened. The Apostle Paul and his missionary team had come to the city of Philippi, and there they had begun to preach the gospel and establish a New Testament church, the church, incidentally, to which Paul would later write the book of Philippians. Well, while they were there in the city of Philippi, they came in contact with a demon-possessed fortune teller, what nowadays, I guess, would be called a psychic. Well, this demon-possessed girl was a servant to some men in the city who were using her tragic condition to enrich themselves. Essentially, these men were nothing more than pimps, only rather than selling the girl for sex, they sold her to tell fortunes by the power of the devil. When this demon-possessed fortune-telling girl came in contact with Paul and his preaching team, she began to follow them around and to hound them, and everywhere they went, day after day for many days, she tagged along behind them and cried out, uh, maybe in a voice of mocking and ridicule, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, she, she may have been doing that in mockery and ridicule, or whether she was or not, there's some people whose endorsement you don't want. Um, for example, I, I don't want the endorsement of some child molester, for example. Well, after this had gone on for quite some time, this girl following Paul and his team around um, uh, and yelling uh, out, these men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation, um, Paul grew weary of it. And so he turned to the girl, and exercising his apostolic power of casting out demons, he demanded in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that the demonic spirit depart from the girl, and so the demon was driven out. Well, when this happened, this girl's pimps realized that along with the departure of the demonic spirit from the girl, her ability to be a psychic and a fortune teller had departed as well, and thus they wouldn't be able to make any more money off of her, and so they got upset. Um, you want to get somebody upset, you just uh, let somebody that they had been making money off of in a wicked way get right with God, that'll upset them. And so these reprobates trumped up some false charges against Paul and his companion Silas, and they brought them before the city authorities. The city authorities unjustly and illegally had Paul and Silas beaten and thrown into jail. They gave the jailer orders to be uh, sure that these two men were kept in prison, and so the jailer took them into the innermost cell of the jail and put their feet in stocks. In other words, he did what in our day would be equivalent as chaining them to the wall so that they couldn't move. As the midnight hour approached, Paul and Silas, rather than complaining and moaning and groaning about how terribly they'd been treated, now that's probably what I would have done if I'd been there, but that's not what they did. Rather, Paul and Silas began to pray and sing and praise the Lord. I mean, here they are with their backs bloody from the beating that they had taken, uh, with their feet uh, chained and locked in the stocks, and yet they're singing and praising the Lord. Well, apparently the Lord got excited about the attitude of Paul and Silas, for he sent an earthquake, and this earthquake opened up the prison doors and broke the stocks and chains that bound the prisoners. The jailer had been asleep, and the earthquake woke him up, he looked around, saw the prison doors open, and assumed that the prisoners had all escaped. Now, according to the law of the Roman Empire of that day, if a jailer lost a prisoner, then he had to give his life for the life of the prisoner which he had lost. However, the law in some cases made a special provision concerning the family of a jailer who lost a prisoner, and that provision was that if the jailer took his own life, then the government would care for his family. On the other hand, if the jailer didn't take his own life and the government had to do it, then his family would not be cared for. 
And so this jailer, assuming that his prisoners had all escaped and that therefore he would ultimately lose his own life as a consequence, decided that he would at least see to it that his family was provided for by taking his own life, and thus he drew out his sword and prepared to commit suicide. The Apostle Paul realized what was happening, and he yelled at the jailer and said, Hey, hold on, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. None of the prisoners have left. Now, that leads me to believe that Paul and Silas had already won the other prisoners to the Lord. You say, why? Well, because the prisoners didn't try to escape. Uh, you go to any jail in this country, go, go downtown to the jail and open the doors and see if the prisoners stay there. Uh, but these prisoners did. And so this jailer, as a result of all these things, fell under deep conviction of the Holy Spirit, and he began to realize there's something to this message of salvation that these prisoners have been talking about, so after taking a light into the cells and seeing that it actually was true, as Paul had said, uh, that the prisoners were all still there, uh, the jailer finally brought Paul and Silas out of their cell and asked them a question. The only time in the Bible that this question is asked in exactly these words, and that question was, what must I do to be saved? And so Paul and Silas told him how to be saved and told his family members how to be saved. The whole family got saved, got baptized, and then all of them went and had a midnight snack. And so I want to, for a few minutes this morning, focus on the question that the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? And I hope you'll hold that question in your mind as I make several observations about it. And so let me point out in the first place that this question, what must I do to be saved, is the all-important question. There's no other question that touches the hem of the garment of this question as far as importance is concerned. And yet the sad thing is that many people do not think of it as being important at all. Now, dear friend, hear me today. If you had cancer and came to a doctor and asked that doctor, what can I do to be cured of cancer? And you actually thought that he could give you the answer, I'll guarantee you, you'd perk up your ears, uh, you'd not let your mind wander to another subject, you'd not allow anyone or anything to distract your attention. Uh, you might even take out a pen and paper and write some things down that the doctor said because you'd consider this question and the answer to it something so important that you would absolutely not do anything that might cause you to miss hearing the answer to that question and you'd be wise for having that that attitude. But dear friend, please hear me. Um, finding the answer to the question, how can I be cured of cancer, is not one trillionth as important as the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? Why? Well, because to find a cure for cancer is to add just a few more days or weeks or months or at the most a few more years to your life, but you'll still eventually die. Uh, but to find the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, is to find eternal, everlasting life which will never end. To find the answer for, to, of, a, of a cure for cancer is to live a while longer on earth with all of its problems and all of its burdens and all of its tears and all of its heartaches. But to find the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, is to live forever in heaven where there are no burdens, there are no tears, there are no heart, heartaches, there is no sorrow. Um, I said that this question, what must I do to be saved, is the all-important question, and yet the devil has deceived many people into believing that it's not important at all. A uh, number of years ago, I heard a preacher, an older preacher, uh, tell a story. He had been driving down uh, a, a, a highway, and he came upon the scene of a terrible car wreck, 
uh, there was a man that had been in the wreck that was now laying out on the shoulder of the highway. Uh, this man was terribly injured. In fact, his legs had been cut off, and it was obvious the way he was bleeding that he was going to die in just a few minutes. And so this preacher told of how he knelt down beside the man and tried to tell him how to be saved. And uh, the man said, I don't need that. I don't want that. I need a doctor. And there he lay on the side of the highway and died and I guess went to hell because he didn't realize the importance of being saved. This question, what must I do to be saved, is the all-important question. Why? Because eternity in heaven or in hell hinges on the answer to that question. Uh, we can see how important this question is by considering some of the things that Jesus said concerning the matter of salvation and how important it is. For example, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, I want you to hear what Jesus said. This may be the most awe-inspiring passage in the entire Bible. Jesus said this in Mark, chapter 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. What could Jesus have said that would show the importance of salvation any more than what he said right there? I mean, he said, if there's some part of your body, hand, a foot, an eye, that's preventing you from being saved, you'd be better off to get rid of that part of your body and get saved and go to heaven than to retain that body part, remain lost and die and go to hell. Now, nobody has to cut their hand off or their foot off or pluck their eye out in order to be saved. All you have to do is trust the Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him as your personal Savior. But Jesus is giving a, a comparison here and saying that if if this were necessary, then a person would be better off without a hand or without a foot or without an eye and go to heaven than to have both hands, both feet, and both eyes and go to hell. Uh, consider a rhetorical question that Jesus asked, which shows us the importance of salvation. In Mark 8 and verse 36, Jesus said this, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Uh, do you understand what he's saying? If you could gain everything in the whole world and you can't, at best you'll get some small tiny portion of what the world has to offer. But even if you could gain everything in the entire world, and yet didn't get saved and died and went to hell, you made a bad bargain. Yeah. Um, if you could get all the money in all the banks in the world and then get all of the precious metals, the gold and silver and so forth, and all the mines in the world, and then uh, get all of the precious stones, the diamonds, the rubies, the pearls and so forth, in all the jewelry stores in the world, and then get all of the oil-producing wells in the world, and then get all the livestock in the world, and then get all the deeds to all the land, all the property in the world, and then get the, all the ownership papers to all the buildings in the world, and then uh, get the ownership and possession of all of the industries in the world, then get all of the fame that the world has to offer, and then get all of the pleasure that the world can give, and then add to this every other single thing that the world has to offer. If you could get all of that, it would profit you nothing if you didn't get saved and so died and went to hell. 
I'm sure that the most prominent man in the second half of the first millennium, that is from the time of Christ to 1000 AD, I'm sure the most prominent man in the Western world was a man they named, that they called Charlemagne. Charlemagne, uh, great conqueror, great ruler, but when Charlemagne, who was over seven feet tall, some say that he approached eight feet in height, when he died, he died, I believe, in 814 A.D. When he died, he was buried in a cave or a vault. They put his throne in there and set his corpse on the throne. They put the ruling scepter in his hand, strapped a sword to his waist, put a crown on his head, put a copy of the Gospels in his lap, Remember that back in those days they didn't have a printing press, so every copy of the scriptures had to be done by hand. So they put a copy of a manuscript of the Gospels in his lap. 180 years later, they opened the tomb, and when they went inside and looked, what they found was that the skeleton had fallen apart and the bones were lying there on the floor, and one skeletal finger was laying on that manuscript of the Gospels, and that finger was pointing to the verse that said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That question, what must I do to be saved, is the all-important question. It's the most important question that you will ever face. Let me say secondly that this question, what must I do to be saved, is a necessary question. In other words, the fact that this jailer asked this question shows us that he understood that he needed to be saved. Now, every human being needs to be saved because every human being is a sinner. Romans 3.23 points out, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, there are some people who will never be saved because they don't think they need to be saved. They think they're really good folks. Uh, and Jesus plainly stated that until a person recognizes their sinfulness, they won't be saved. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13, Jesus said, For I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The first prerequisite to being saved is to recognize that you're a sinner and as such you need to be saved. And once you recognize that, then you're in a position to get saved. And so this question, what must I do to be saved, it's the all-important question. It's a necessary question. Thirdly, let me say that it's a personal question. What must I do to be saved? The responsibility of being saved fell on him, and he recognized that. Now, so I've heard people say some strange things. Somebody said, well, if God wants to save me, he can save me. No, dear friend, God has already done His part. He gave His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. Jesus died, shed His blood, was buried, and rose again three days later to make it possible for you to be saved. Now, God's already done everything He's going to do to get you saved. Now it's up to you. And my dear friend, the Bible teaches you'll either come to Christ and trust Him and get saved and go to heaven, or you'll spend eternity in hell, is what the Bible says. Uh, somebody says, well, i tell you one thing. My parents are good Christians. Well, I'm glad for them. But that, I mean, it helps you, helps you to be in, in a position where you're more likely to trust the Lord. But because they're saved doesn't mean you're saved. You've got to be saved for yourself. Nobody else can be saved for you, you and you alone can be saved for you. It's a personal question. This question, what must I do to be saved, it's the 
all-important question. It's a necessary question. It's a personal question. And let me say, finally, it's an answered question. We don't have to wonder what the answer is for the same passage where the question is asked it's also answered. Verse 30, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now to believe on Christ doesn't just mean to believe in his existence. It means to put your faith in him. Trust him as your savior. Ask him to be your savior and take you to heaven. And I hope that you'll get this question answered personally in your own life before you leave here today. Um, most of you have uh, heard my testimony, but when I was 18 years old on March the 24th, 1976, I came to the place where this question became my question. What must I do to be saved? It was on a Wednesday night. I was at my brother's house. Uh, he and his family were gone to church. They were Christians. They went to church on Wednesday night, uh, but I didn't go. And uh, all the time they were at church, the Lord was really working on my heart. And I'd been under conviction for a long time because my mother had been praying for me for years and my brother had been witnessing to me uh, for three years, three, the three years since he had been saved. And so, the, but, but that night especially, the Lord really dealt with my heart, and I came to the, to the feeling, the, to the idea, and interestingly, I've heard a number of people say that they, they had this same idea when they got saved, but the thought came into my mind, I think the Lord put it there, that if I didn't get saved that night, I was never going to get saved. If I didn't get saved then, I would go to hell. And I believe that still. So that night, they came home from church. I guess it's probably about 9 o'clock. Uh, I went into my bedroom and uh, sat down, just sat there on the edge of the bed, and one of the kids came through, and I asked the kid, uh, ask your daddy to come here and talk to me. And so my brother, who'd been witnessing to me for three years, came through the door and looked at me, and he said, you want to get saved? And, you know, I, I did. I just told him, get the Bible. I knew the Bible had something to do with it. And so he got his Bible and came in and sat down by my side there on the edge of that bed and opened his Bible and showed me how to be saved through the old Romans Road, as they call it. And that night, I bowed my head, asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior, and I got saved that night. That question, what must I do to be saved, became my question, and I got the answer that night. If you don't know that you're going to heaven when you die, I hope that this morning you'll get that question answered in your life.